Well, good morning. My name is Hisham Shahab. I am with uh, Salam Christian Fellowship and Messiah for Muslims. I do missions to Muslims in the United States. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the religious roots of the struggle in the Middle East, uh, especially talking about uh, uh, we'll go back actually to the Old Testament a little bit and talk about Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac as well. Uh, if we, if you go back to Genesis 15, you see that Abraham, before he was called Abraham, uh, had some doubts about, uh, you know, uh, about uh, God's promise to him. But God took him out and told them, Behold, you have, you have given me no... Uh, uh, Abraham was talking to, to God. Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside, God brought him outside, and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, uh, with time, Abraham kind of weakened, and Sarah told him, Why don't we help God out? And gave him Hagar. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when you uh, kind of, uh, when God has a plan and you have your own plan, you mess up things, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, this was how Ishmael was born. And Ishmael, as, uh, as uh, uh, Genesis 16 says, He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kins, kinsmen. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know the story, but uh, let me say that I was in Europe for a family reunion for 14 days, and, uh, and uh, one of the highlights of the trip was swinging by Rome, uh, in Rome, the, one of the largest landmarks is the Colosseum. The Colosseum is where the Romans used to, uh, the arena where the Romans used to have the gladiators and the animals uh, fight each other, what have you. And uh, the tour guide, you know, uh, was explaining and said that the Colosseum was built in eight years between 71 AD to 78 AD, something like that. So I asked her, so that's really uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem. She said, she, we have a smart guy here, you know. <laughs> and uh, she said, actually, the money that, uh, you know, the gold, taken from the destruction of Jerusalem, okay, uh, Flavian, the emperor, built the Colosseum from that money, from the gold, oh, wow. taken from Jerusalem. And then she pointed away to uh, a victory ark by Titus, okay, Titus is uh, a governor who destroyed Jerusalem on behalf of Flavian, the emperor, okay. I think his son was, was his son. So an ark to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem. Why I'm telling you this? Because uh, uh, in the Middle East, Muslims have a different story. They say that uh, 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 they, they have uh, the right for Jerusalem because they had the Dome of the Rock, and uh, the Dome of the Rock was the first direction of prayer for Muslims. And they deny the Jewish history. They, many, many Palestinians, if you ask them about the archaeological side, they tell, well, these are fake 
and the Israelis brought them just to prove their uh, legitimacy, etc. So, uh, even in the Quran, the Book of Islam, Abraham uh, is, is, was going to slaughter Ishmael, not, not Isaac. So, uh, even though the Quran doesn't specifically say Ishmael, but Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, said that he is the grandson of Ishmael who was to be slaughtered. So, so Muhammad is the son of the promise, you see. So the struggle goes back a long way, and uh, Muslims claim that Abraham and Ishmael built Mecca, okay, the Kaaba. That Abraham used to come to Arabia from all, all the way from the Holy Land to Arabia, which is Mecca today in Saudi Arabia, and Ishmael and Abraham built the Kaaba. Okay, the Kaaba, the, sick, uh, the most sacred place in Islam. So, uh, so it's really kind of a different world view, and uh, that will not be really, the twins shall not meet as, uh, as uh, the heart of darkness says, you know. Even, even the Quran, the Book of Islam, talks about Abraham being a Muslim. And it says that Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was, you know, a Muslim. And if you want to follow Abraham, become a Muslim. So, yeah, it's kind of uh, really topsy-turvy, as they say, you know. And uh, so, and unlike Judaism, uh, Islam is a proselytizing religion, and it's a political system as well. So, uh, so, uh, so Islam was born in, in, uh, in uh, uh, 610 AD. Muhammad was born 570 AD. And uh, when he turned 40, he claimed that he received revelations from Allah. And uh, it was 610 AD when he uh, started talking about uh, the oneness of God or Allah, and uh, calling uh, his people to worship one God, Allah. And then uh, uh, he was able to convert the uh, first 70 people. Then he moved to, uh, I, I'm not going to go deeply into the story here, but uh, uh, Islam expanded uh, in 25 years to <coughs> conquer the old world, OK? the old world from India, from India to Spain, actually, you know. And uh, uh, Spain was conquered in 711, and uh, France, uh, uh, they couldn't conquer Spain. So these were the Arab kingdoms that came one after another, and they reached Spain, and then they conquered Spain for 500 years or more, and then they stopped at uh, the gates of France. Charles the Hammer stopped them in 732 AD. And uh, this was the largest expansion of the Arab Kingdom, as I said, from Afghanistan to, to Spain. Uh, any question before I go on? Because we're going to talk a little bit about history here and uh, how things really materialized to, to this day and age, OK? So uh, uh, the, the Arab kingdoms couldn't really conquer uh, Constantinople or Byzantium and East Europe. It had to wait till the Ottomans, who came in 1453 and was able to destroy the walls of, Byz of Byzantium, Constantinople, and go into, uh, into what today is called Turkey, okay, conquer Constantinople and, uh, and then go into Eastern Europe and reach Vienna, okay. They reached the wall of Vienna in 1529. When Martin Luther was writing, he called all Muslims Turks because the threat of the Turks was at the gates of Vienna and the Polish army especially was able to deter the Turks and they stopped there. Uh, 
it had to wait till 1683, till uh, the Ottomans in September 1683 tried again at the gates of Vienna, okay, and uh, they were defeated at the gates of Vienna again in 1683, September 1683. This is why uh, many observers say Bin Laden perpetrated the terrorist attack in September to say here we come again, it is another September, okay? So, uh, I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm giving you some of the background of the Islamic story in order to go into the Palestinian story, if I can say, you know. So, uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire was uh, defeated in World War I, as we all know, they sided with the Germans and they lost the, the war with the Germans. This was the last map of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were defeated and uh, the Allied forces, the French and the British, came into, into Turkey and did something that would be a very kind of, very traumatic to the Arab world. The, the, uh, the Ottomans had to, uh, or Turkey, modern Turkey, had to abolish the caliphate. Who knows what's the caliphate? Have you heard? The Caliphate is the seat of Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam. It means every, uh, everyone who succeeded Muhammad uh, on leading the Muslim world was called Caliph. And the seat was called Caliphate. So the, the last Caliph was the Ottoman Sultan uh, who was uh, abolished and he was exiled to Italy. And uh, Ataturk tried to modernize the modern Turkey after he freed Turkey from the Allied forces and declared modern Turkey. So that was 1918. The story of the uh, problems in the, in the Holy Land, if I can say, started with the Belfort Declaration. The Ottomans were defeated, the Allied forces came into the Middle East, and the British uh, <coughs> promised the Jews a comeback to the Holy Land, okay? And it was called the Belfort Declaration. It was, Belfort was a foreign minister of the British Empire, Great Britain, and uh, they issued a memorandum promising, you know, the... Uh, the Jews a homeland in what they called later Palestine. Now, uh, the British are a nation of shopkeepers, so they say that uh, they owed uh, Rothschild money, Rothschild banks money, uh, for, the, uh, uh, the, for the Suez Canal, if you remember the digging of the Suez Canal in the 19th century, and so to pay back Rothschild, they uh, issued the Belfort Declaration to promise the Jews a homeland in Palestine. So, <coughs> when the, if you have any question, please interrupt me because I'm really going through a lot of uh, information here. Uh, so, uh, when the Allied forces conquered uh, the Middle East, uh, two officers, a British officer and a French diplomat, met and decided to divide the Middle East into uh, spheres of power, French and British. So on an empty map, they created new, new countries. They created Lebanon, they created uh, Palestine, they crea created Jordan. So mainly Palestine and Jordan were under a British mandate, and, uh, and the British uh, uh, started uh, welcoming, if I can say, Jewish immigrants from all over the world. Uh, the Muslims were not ha very happy at all about the new uh, Jewish settlers. Uh, now, the story of Jewish settlers in Palestine is, uh, is not simple. First, the Jewish agency bought a lot of land in, in Palestine, uh, which was under the British mandate. And then uh, this land was, you know, uh, used for settlers who came from, from different parts of the world, especially Russia and East Europe, okay? 
So, uh, uh, and uh, the, Brit the, the Muslims, uh, when the British came in, considered it a crusader. A crusader, another new crusader uh, upon Muslim lands, and they revoked or invoked the memory of Saladin. Saladin is a Muslim uh, general who was able to free Jerusalem from, from the crusaders in 1187. And they, uh, what the line, what they, the line they have now is that uh, as Saladin was able to free uh, Jerusalem from the Crusaders in the 12th century, after 200 years of Crusaders occupation, the Palestinians will be able to free Palestine from the from the Jewish state, even if it goes more than a hundred years. Okay, so. They really invoke history all the time, and uh, and uh, and uh, especially Saladin. So again, Jewish settlers started uh, uh, flocking into the Holy Land from all over the world, uh, including the Arab nations, because uh, and uh, there were riots in the streets. The Arabs uh, rejected uh, the. Israeli or Jewish settlements, and there was there was a lot of civil strife, especially in 1936 when uh, when a uh, a uh, uh, 1936 a British uh, delegation came to the Holy Land and uh, proposed a division of the land between a Jewish state and an Arab state. Uh, the Arabs rejected uh, the proposal, the British proposal. Okay. So that was the first one, 1936, okay? And there were riots, uh, and uh, many, uh, the f uh, many Jews were uh, killed, as well as many Arabs as well. Uh, the Arabs formed militias, as well as the Jews formed militias as well, called the Haganahs, and they started attacking even the British colonial powers. These are Arab uh, militias, while these are were Jewish, uh, you know, the Haganahs. So, uh, uh, any questions before I go on? So, 1936, uh, you know, the Nazis were rising in Europe, and the Palestinians, or the Arabs in the Holy Land, saw that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the highest Muslim cleric in Jerusalem went to Germany and met with Hitler, okay, and, uh, and he, uh, he promised, uh, or he, he told Hitler, I'll help you form SSS uh, groups from Muslims in Europe in order to, to kill Jews if you promise that when you arrive to the Holy Land because uh, as you remember, Rommel, the, the German, uh, you know, general was already in North Africa trying to invade uh, Egypt and uh, working his way, the German army working its way towards the Holy Land. So there was an alliance between the Arabs in the Holy Land and the Nazis that they are going to slaughter the Jews in the Holy Land eventually. Okay, including the settlers. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Nazis uh, lost the war and uh, the dreams of the, a, a Holocaust in the Holy Land didn't work out. And, uh, and uh, in 1945, uh, you know, after the defeat of the Nazis and uh, and uh, 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 the end of World War II, uh, both the, the British and the French were not able to keep their, their colonies because they were uh, worn out because of the two wars they went through, and they handed the problem of the Holy Land, the problem between the Arab uh, uh, residents and the Jewish settlers, to the to the to the United Nations. The United Nations declared a two-state solution. Okay, a two-state solution and declared Jerusalem a 
an international zone. Okay? Today, every time they talk about the Palestinian Israel, they say a two-state solution would solve the problem. Well, the Palestinians were offered a two-state solution in 1936. The Arabs rejected it, and then in 1947, they were offered a two-state solution, a Jewish state and an Arab state, and, and they were offered uh, Jerusalem as an international zone open to all religions. Again, the Arabs rejected that uh, resolution, the UN resolution, and they gathered five armies uh, uh, and attacked Israel, okay, the new Jewish state. Uh, now, uh, Palestinians always try to kind of give you another, uh, you know, uh, story about this, saying that, no, no, Israel attacked the five armies. I mean, I don't think that it's logical that uh, a small state, half a million people would attack, you know, uh, five Arab armies, uh, especially that my uncle was a member of what they call the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army was an Arab army formed of volunteers from all Arab uh, countries that were willing to go and fight in, in Palestine. So my uncle was part of that. Also, my father was a blacksmith. He used to, to make grenades for the army, or the Arab army. So I have eyewitnesses, you know, who, who could vow, or I mean late witnesses now, they both passed away. They vowed that they really kind of went all the way to Palestine to root out the Jewish settlers, okay? So five armies attacked the Jewish state, and uh, one of the problems of the five Arab armies that they cornered uh, the Jews, and the Jews fought like lions and defeated five Arab armies, and 800,000 refugees came out of Israel and Palestine. Half of them settled in Lebanon, where I come from. And at the same time, the Arab countries displaced 700,000 Jews that lived in the Arab countries. There were something like uh, uh, more than 150,000 Jews in Morocco, 38,000 in Libya, 75,000 in Egypt, all what have you, you know. All in all, together, 700,000 Jews were displaced. Half of them went and to, to Israel, and the others went to the West. Okay, so it's not really uh, uh, only a, a matter of Palestinian refugees. There were also Jewish refugees who flocked to the Holy Land. Some of them lived in tents while uh, the UN built uh, really camps for Palestinian refugees. Now, when you hear Palestinian refugees, they don't live in tents. They live in shanty towns built by the UNRWA, UN uh, Relief and uh, Work Development for uh, Palestinian Refugees. While the, Jewish, the first Jewish refugee, refugees lived in tents until they were able to get support and uh, move to apartments, okay? So, uh, so it's not a simple story. So, uh, 1948 was the first war that uh, the Arabs, uh, you know, lost. In 1967, the Arabs decided to attack Israel again, especially Nasser of Egypt. And uh, it was another humiliating defeat. 20,000 uh, 20, uh, Egyptian soldiers were captured by Israel, and uh, Israel took Sinai, uh, took Sinai and the West Bank. So Israel, which was, uh, let me go back here a little bit. Yeah, you see Israel was, this blue state here, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
So this, these blue spots were Israel, 1948. So when uh, the Arabs attacked 1967, I was seven years old, I remember that. So the, uh, uh, the Arabs were defeated and Israel was able to take Sinai and the West Bank and the Golan Heights as well, okay? And uh, so this became the new uh, uh, map of Israel before 1977, okay? Any questions? Yeah. Is, could we just back up to the 1947? Would you... Yes to this question, I've heard it said both ways. Some say that yeah. the Palestinian refugees refused to be ruled by the Jews and so they left, and others say no, the Jews kicked them out. Well, there are two stories. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, I, I read a uh, revisionist called Benny Morris. Uh, he's an uh, Israeli historian who is very objective. He thinks that Many Arab refugees left because of fear. There were uh, hostilities. And, uh, and also the Arab nations who were attacking the, the Jewish state promised the Arabs that they'd come back in two weeks. They told them, come out to Lebanon, to Syria, to Jordan. We'll destroy the Israel, and then you can come back in two weeks. It, they never went back. Okay, so there was uh, the element of fear. There were two massacres, actually, uh, we should mention. 1929, uh, the Arabs massacred uh, the Jewish uh, 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 population in Hebron, which is Nablus, where the, the tomb of Abraham, okay, and the cave of the patriarchs. They killed 80 Jews. So 80 Jews, uh, you know, uh, is a big number compared to the Jewish population there in Hebron. Uh, then later uh, there was a massacre called Deir Yassin, which really uh, kind of made Arabs uh, fear for their lives uh, and flee uh, free is Israel uh, also, where uh, maybe a hundred uh, Arabs were massacred. Uh, it's a complicated story. There were hostilities and so uh, so it's two things. First, uh, the Arab nations, armies coming to the rescue told the Arab uh, uh, residents, leave and we'll bring you back. They never came back. And the element of fear as well. Okay? So, yeah. So, uh, any other question? It's okay? <coughs> yeah. I know it's a, uh, I'm going through a lot of uh, history in a short time, but uh, so uh, so when uh, also when Israel conquered Gaza and the West Bank, uh, many Palestinians came out of Gaza as well, and uh, Gaza. But we need to to notice that the West Bank and Gaza were under Arab rule for. 17 years, from 1948 to 1967. And Jordan uh, and Egypt never declared a Palestinian state, okay? They could have done that, you know, but they were not interested, okay? So, uh, uh, so these are new uh, refugees who came out of Gaza, and uh, as you see, this is a Palestinian holding the key to his home, saying that they promised us to come back in two weeks, and we never went back, okay? And they decided to take uh, the struggle into their hands. So in 1963, the PLO was formed. Uh, some say that the KGB was behind the formation, the establishment of the PLO. And uh, Yasser Arafat star rose then, and uh, in 1969, this is something very, very important, uh, what they call the Cairo Agreement, uh, after the defeat of the Arab uh, uh, armies in 1967, uh, the Arab leaders met in Sudan and said, no recognition, no peace, no negotiations. And then they uh, decided to support the, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, 
and uh, decided that uh, they are going to, uh, in Cairo, uh, support uh, the PLO to form uh, military bases in South Lebanon. Okay, South Lebanon, where I come from. South Lebanon is hilly and very strategic. If you stand on a hill in South Lebanon and throw Iraq, you'll hit a Jew in, in North Israel, you know. So they start launching attacks on North Israel, and Israel started retaliating, uh, you know, uh, uh, to protect herself. Israel started shooting back at South Lebanon in order to protect itself from uh, the Palestinian militias. Uh, this went on and on till 1982, when Israel decided that they are going to clean up uh, South Lebanon, they invaded Lebanon and reached Beirut where they were able to root out the PLO and the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization militias left to Tunisia from there and, uh, and then uh, any questions before I go on because I'm going really quick here. So in 1993 the Palestinians were offered a state also by Clinton, okay, Bill Clinton, uh, Rabin, and uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Yasser Arafat met in Oslo, and they decided about uh, a roadmap for a Palestinian state, and they brought back Arafat to the West Bank, okay. 1993, they brought back Arafat to rule the West Bank and they created what they called the Palestinian Authority as a roadmap for a Palestinian state. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the, the, the initiative failed because Hamas started uh, a wave of suicide bombing, okay, that really foiled the plans of peace, okay? Hamas, which was founded in 1987, okay, uh, rose to power because the PA was very corrupt and the Palestinians really did not have faith in the Palestinian Authority, and uh, it was a wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? And uh, they uh, started a wave of suicide bombing that foiled peace, and uh, the founder of, uh, of Hamas was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, his name was Ahmed Yassin, and uh, in their charter they vowed for the annihilation of, uh, of, of Israel. They quote a hadith, a statement by Muhammad, that says the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when the Jew will hide behind stones and trees, the stones and trees will say, oh Muslims, this an apocalyptic kind of vision of Islam saying that one day the Jews all over the world will be slaughtered by Muslims, especially in the Holy Land. So Hamas has this in their charter and they kind of uh, consider, you know, uh, that uh, killing the Jews, not only Israelis, killing Jews is kosher and it's really kind of the... So, Hamas' social base is the Palestinian people. Uh, recently, uh, it proved that 70% of Palestinians support Hamas. 70% of Palestinians support Hamas, whether in, uh, in the West Bank or in the Gaza Strip, okay? <coughs> and, uh, so, what about Gaza, okay? Uh, was Gaza occupied? Because we always talked about uh, here about the occupation of Palestine. Gaza was uh, <coughs> Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005. Ariel Sharon decided that he was the prime minister of Israel that he's not going to rule another nation anymore. So in 2005, he pulled out of Gaza and left all of Gaza, and he dismantled even the settlements. So. Hamas uh, took, uh, had elections, Hamas and the PLO had elections, and Hamas won the 40% of the vote. And what Hamas did is they killed out 
all the PLO operatives, like 470, and took over. Okay, took over by force and uh, aligned themselves with with uh, with with uh, uh, Iran, Iran and Hezbollah. So uh, Iran and Hezbollah always brag about the dream of going and praying in Jerusalem. Okay, and. Uh, with Hamas, the struggle between the Palestinians, if I can call them that, and the Israelis turned from a national struggle into a religious struggle. Okay, because uh, Hamas brought in uh, Islamic ideology and that uh, uh, Islam, uh, 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 the first uh, direction of prayer, which is Jerusalem, should be freed from the Jews. So they brought in the uh, Islamic ideology and uh, this way the struggle became, I believe, endless. Okay, uh, now I need to shift in order to talk about the formation or establishment of the Muslim Brotherhood. If you have any question before that, yes. I just have one quick question going back to uh, biblical claims on the lands. Yeah. Uh, that God promised Moses Canaan. Yeah. Uh, but I've read re recently that there's uncertainty of where exactly Canaan was and that Gaza could play into that, or maybe Gaza was part of Philistia. Yes. The Philistines. Yes. But then that, they, they claim that that predates God's promise to Moses. So that's, that's where they're basing some of their, their claims on. Is there any, have, have you yeah, run into sure. that? The Philistines died out and they were in Gaza. This is why uh, Ariel Sharon said Gaza is not Israel, you know, and they uh, they used to worship Dogen, the uh, uh, sea god, you know. So they died out, uh, remember David and Goliath, you know. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the end of the Philistines, I mean, they were gone. So the what we call Palestinians today are not really descendants of the Philistines, okay. okay? And Gaza was not part of Israel proper. So, uh, but Canaan was really the coastal plains, you know? From, uh, from Tyre, even Lebanon was part of Canaan. From Tyre to, 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 Gaza, to, to Gaza, actually. So Gaza was not part of it. Okay. <coughs> so, but uh, I mean, uh, we Lutherans don't really uh, kind of uh, believe in uh, in uh, uh, pastor can really talk better than me on that. We don't uh, kind of uh, uh, believe that uh, you know uh, in in modern day Israel. We believe that uh, you know it's kind of uh, uh, the land is for the uh, the fittest, you know, and we don't really give it a theological really. Uh, value uh, the present day Israel. It's a political entity, you know. It's not really a uh, the, the Israel that we are, uh, you know. Uh, St. Paul said Jews will come to faith, you know, but uh, unless they are followers of Jesus Christ, they are not to be, are not going to be saved, you know. So we don't really uh, kind of, uh, uh, we believe in the two kingdoms. We don't uh, really mix between the two. Okay, you know, uh, Pastor, you, maybe you can extrapolate more on this, you know. Yeah, so uh, we, we don't believe that we need to support Israel so that Jesus will come back, you know, as uh, uh, quickly, you know. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, what about uh, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood? I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. It will be not a long presentation. Uh, uh, remember we talked about the abolition of the caliphate, right? The caliph was abolished and uh, this was very traumatic for the Muslim world because imagine that a Catholic church without a pope, okay? And the Muslim world, the Sunni Muslim world felt that they are without a head. And, uh, uh, and in Egypt, which was the most powerful country after Turkey then, uh, a, uh, a, an Egyptian uh, teacher 
met with his uh, uh, disciples and they decided to form an organization that would Islamicize the community. His name was Hassan al-Banna and uh, he called the, the, the organization the Muslim Brotherhood and they decided that they are going to uh, Islamicize the community by reviving uh, uh, Islam in the community because Muslims forget about the glory days of Islam and many of them did not know how to read the Quran, the book of Islam, many of them did not know about the statements of Muhammad and so they, they started uh, having uh, lessons, uh, Islamic lessons, religious lessons at homes and in mosques, etc. and he uh, traveled the country, was able to summon uh, or recruit half a million people in Egypt then. I mean, Egypt was not a hundred million like today, so half a million was a big number. And, uh, and their ideology thought, uh, is that they are going to spread this uh, revivalist Islam all over the world in order to enact a caliphate, to bring back the rule of the global Muslim state. However, in 1952, uh, the, in Egypt, uh, a class of uh, officers were able to topple the monarchy. Uh, Egypt was a monarchy and, uh, and bring in uh, uh, a revolution that declared the Republic of, uh, uh, Arab Republic of Egypt. And the Muslim Brotherhood thought that they're going to have a big say because uh, those uh, officers used to attend their Islamic religious lessons. However, uh, Nasser of Egypt persecuted the Muslim Brotherhood and he threw their, uh, their uh, master philosopher in, uh, in prison and later executed him in 1966. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, fled out uh, because of persecution. Oh, and spread out all over the Arab world where they started uh, establishing cells and this really uh, kind of helped the establishment of Muslim Brotherhood movements all over the Arab world as well as in the West. I'm going to go quick here because one of the Muslim Brotherhood group was uh, responsible for assassinating Sadat and uh, that was Zawahiri, the, uh, the uh, second in command of the Taliban or, or, or the Al-Qaeda, uh, the deputy of Bin Laden. Okay, and uh, so the Muslim Brotherhood had a lot of kind of influence, uh, especially in the establishment of Al-Qaeda as well and all radical. One of the problems uh, or one of the things that really uh, uh, kind of uh, really affect us in the West is that the Muslim Brotherhood spread to the West with the help of the Eisenhower uh, 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 administration. The, uh, the Eisenhower administration supported uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to establish a mosque in Munich. It was the first and largest mosque in Western Europe uh, and uh, uh, the Eisenhower uh, vision was to, col to bring the malcontents of the Soviet Union and recruit them against communism. However, the Muslim Brotherhood used uh, our taxpayer money in order to spread their ideology and today they are in every Western country, uh, especially what they call uh, uh, also Qatar. Uh, uh, so this is one of the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood who made it to Qatar and uh, they are in Qatar, in Lebanon, in Israel, uh, the West Bank, okay. So what about America? I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Muslim Brotherhood in America. There is uh, a, a uh, movement called Muslim uh, Student Association. It exists in every college campus on, in the United States and the West. They are the Muslim Brotherhood uh, nucleus really and uh, they go from there and uh, they uh, preach jihad and uh, Islam radicalize uh, really kind of uh, 
the Muslim population in the West and work against the integration of Muslims in the West. So, uh, for example, one of the uh, consequences of the Muslim Brotherhood in America was the bombing of the Twin Towers in 1993, before, you know, Al-Qaeda even. You know, the blind Imam was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he recruited uh, bombers who were able to, to attack uh, the Twin Towers the first time in 1993. So, uh, uh, in, uh, in 2004, before I left, uh, before I left uh, 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 Lebanon uh, for good, I met with the uh, uh, advisor of Hamas in uh, Beirut. I was a journalist, uh, and uh, the advisor of Hamas came to Beirut, uh, and he, he had published uh, a, uh, a book about Islam and the West, so I was very interested. So uh, I uh, interviewed him, and, uh, and uh, uh, especially after I learned that he was the head of a think tank in, in Virginia, uh, south of uh, DC, and uh, especially imagine that the advisor of Hamas, the head of a think tank in Virginia, south of DC. So he kind of uh, wrapped up that think tank and uh, went to Gaza after that to become full-time advisor to the uh, to the prime minister of Hamas. So. I interviewed him and asked him about uh, his vision for the Muslims in America. He said, Muslims in America cannot integrate. We have a different culture, we have different values. Values. We can live side by side only. We, we, we can acculturate, we cannot integrate. Okay? So, uh, uh, one anecdote which is very important here is that uh, I asked him, uh, Dr. Youssef, uh, you lived 18 years in the United States, and how many children do you have? He said, I have five children. I asked him, so all of them were born in the United States? He said, no. My wife is Israeli Arab. When she is due, we go back to Israel and have the baby because the Israeli passport is better than the American passport. So this is the advisor of Hamas, okay? So this is really something, a personal experience I had with the advisor of Hamas, you know, to show you the hypocrisy, you know. So, so the uh, Muslim Student Association, as I said, it's in every college campus, uh, in every, you can find them in Madison, okay, uh, Wisconsin, you can find them in uh, Chicago, you can find them in every uh, public, uh, stay, uh, uh, university campus, as well as uh, really kind of, uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, private. Recently, somebody uh, contacted me from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Concordia, Wisconsin. He said they are gonna, they were trying to uh, have a prayer room for Muslim students at Concordia, and I told them I'm against that, don't do it, you know. Uh, so some of the administration were buying into it, you know, so we have to be careful, okay? These are Muslim Brotherhood, okay? So uh, what about the Muslim Brotherhood in America and how it really uh, turned out, uh, how were they kind of... In, in the 90s, there was the, uh, a document was discovered that the Muslim Brotherhood in America is working to change the social fabric through radicalizing Muslims and converting Christians to Islam as well. And in addition, they were raising money to support Hamas. So after 1993, the American administration blacklisted, blacklisted Hamas and sent the FBI to find out who is supporting Hamas. They found an American uh, Palestinian who was funneling millions of dollars into Hamas from the United States, especially from Florida and Chicagoland, okay? So, uh, so these are the, really the Muslim Brotherhood chapters that support Hamas in the United States. Uh, Abu Marzouk fled, Musa Abu Marzouk fled, and he's a fugitive. 
now living in Jordan, American Palestinian living in Jordan, you know, a fugitive. Uh, there is a chapter in, uh, in uh, Oak Brook, Illinois, of the Muslim Brotherhood. They have a uh, fund that supports mosques as well. Okay, they are Muslim Brotherhood. And there is CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations, which is the largest really uh, facade for the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in the United States. They have a chapter in every, in every state, and they really promote uh, radical Islam. Uh, the head of CARE glorified the attacks of September 7, and he said they bring us dignity and, and life. Okay? And uh, this is another uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, leader. He, he lives on, on the south side of Chicago, okay? Chicagoland mainly has 200,000 Palestinian Muslims. Most of them support Hamas, you know? And they have like 40 mosques and 50 organizations that support radical Islam, yeah. Is that Bernie Sanders? Yes, right. right. Okay. Yeah. And he's meeting with yeah, the Muslim Brotherhood found that they can ally themselves with the far, le far left, actually, you know. I'm not talking politics here, but this is really the nature of the beast. That the far left found that they can really ally themselves with... Even the LGBTQ now are saying that they are for freedom <laughs> for Palestine, you know. You know, the LGBTQ, if they go to Gaza, they throw them from the highest... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, building, okay? So, uh, this one is in Milwaukee. Uh, I had a personal experience with him called Muslim American Society. Uh, he is a Palestinian. Uh, I don't know if they, he was given the American passport because he was jailed in Israel for, uh, for uh, he was uh, handing cash to Hamas and was arrested in Israel. Uh, he organizes a conference every uh, Thanksgiving weekend and uh, every Christmas weekend in Chicagoland. There are 2,500 Palestinians who come for that conference. I, uh, in 2018, I signed up for that conference uh, that called American Muslims for Palestine and Muslim American Society. So I signed up for that conference, paid the fee, and went in. He, he saw me pay, taking notes. I am an author, so I take notes in order to write, you know, articles. So he sent five uh, security guards who removed me, you know, and uh, so uh, done with the freedom of speech, you know. Freedom of speech for them, not for us, you know. So uh, that's really the, his name is Salah Sarsour. So this is another, you know, uh, uh, American Muslim for Palestine official, he lives in D.C. and he really organizes those uh, uh, events, uh, demonstrations against Israel in, uh, with his colleague uh, called uh, uh, Jamal. Uh, they have an umbrella organization that really, so they coordinate all the radical Muslim organizations together under this called U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations. So they are very active. Uh, the largest mosque in the uh, Sunni mosque in the United States is the Mosque Foundation in Bridgeview. One of you mentioned Bridgeview here. I don't know. He left. So Bridgeview is uh, is a neighborhood on uh, of Harlem and 87. If you know that uh, corner, uh, it ha the mosque has two ten thousand worshippers. They close. Uh, the, they close the uh, uh, roads when they have a Friday prayer, usually in summer. And uh, that mosque has been supporting Hamas since the 1980s. Actually, I found a document written by the hand of this uh, imam uh, sending instructions to Hamas about terrorist attacks. You know, how do I know it says because Set a thief to catch a thief. I was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I know their calligraphy, the way they write. And he is trained like I was trained. And uh, I mean, uh, there were, before the email and the internet, they, they used to send faxes from Chicago into 
into Gaza and the West Bank with instructions of terrorist attacks. It's that really, really dangerous. Uh, I wrote an article uh, a few years ago about a Libyan uh, student who was recruited by the Mosque Foundation and they used to send those international Arab students for training on firearms to Kansas, okay, and then send them back to Gaza or the West Bank, okay, and the Libyan student was caught and uh, by the FBI and uh, one of the uh, elders of the mosque was caught with $650,000 uh, in his uh, possession and arrested by the Israeli authorities and then he was deported back to Chicagoland. So uh, it's really, you know, it's a, there was a, uh, a, uh, a trial called the Holy Land uh, F uh, Foundation trial in 2008 where uh, some of the operatives fled, like the guy in uh, the fugitive in Jordan, and others were given life sentences or 20 year sentences, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, President Obama had to intercede and uh, kind of stop the investigation because the investigation included many, many imams that were really active in many mosques in the United States and they were called unindicted co-conspirators, co you know. They gave them this title. So, so really kind of, uh, uh, we are not li re really living in a bubble. We are in the middle of, uh, you know, a, uh, a tide that, of Islamism that's working to change the social fabric in the United States, especially that the Muslim world, you know, and the Arab world is not really kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, while the West is being secularized, the, the, the Middle East and the Muslim world is being radicalized. I want really to, this, uh, to quote uh, the head of Azhar. Azhar is the highest authority in Sunni Islam in Egypt and the world, and when uh, the attacks of September 7 took place. This is the Arabic statement by the head of uh, the Azhar uh, University and uh, mosque. This is a translation of the statement. Uh, he said that the proud Palestinian restored our confidence, breathed spirit into us, and restored life to us after we thought it would never come back again. So it's really we are facing uh, and a, a radical Muslim ideology that's preached all over the world, you know, not only in the Middle East, okay? And uh, let me go quick here. I, uh, one uh, kind of beacon of hope uh, I wanted to mention, uh, as I said in my message, the Somali-born Dutch-American activist Ayan Hirshi Ali, who was a... Uh, a, an atheist, and uh, she was a Muslim first, and uh, she was uh, a victim of uh, uh, female genital mutilation, and she fled to uh, Holland uh, to flee from a, a child marriage. There she learned Dutch, and uh, then she, uh, when 9-11 took place, she was disillusioned with Islam completely. She revoked Islam and became an atheist and uh, wrote uh, books, uh, one of them, uh, Infidel, and, uh, and she's, she's, she's been for 20 years an atheist, promoting uh, atheism and talking about the danger of Islamism, and one of the things that uh, her husband is a scholar in uh, Texas, uh, Neil Ferguson, uh, Neil Ferguson says, you can fight terrorism, but you cannot fight Islamism because we believe in freedom of uh, religion. And uh, Islam, which is not only a religion, a personal, it's a political system, hides behind Islam as a personal religion. So we can, it's very, very difficult to fight Islamism. So Ayan Hirshi Ali thinks that uh, uh, she, uh, 
she uh, uh, just two months ago she declared that she became a Christian and this is what she said in her article you can find her article in uh, unheard if you google unheard you can fight find the whole article about why I am now a Christian she said the lesson I learned from years with the Muslim Brotherhood was the power of a unifying story embedded in the foundational text of Islam to attract, engage, and mobilize the Muslim masses. The Muslim masses all over the world are, are moved by radical Islam. Unless we offer something as meaningful, I fear the erosion of our civilization will continue. Unless we offer something as meaningful, I fear the erosion of our civilization will continue. And fortunately, there is no need to look for some new age con concoction of medication and meaningfulness. Christianity has it all. Christianity. The church has it all. Okay? So, I think I'll end here. Okay? Sorry, it's kind of a little bit branched and a lot of information, but I thought I could give you today two parts, one about the Palestinian question and another about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the origin of, of Hamas, which is a, uh, a uh, chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood. Any questions? This is sort of a, sort of a scary situation. In other words, Christianity in the United States is decreasing it appears Muslims in their expansion is going well the other way. They are doing it through immigration, and the chain immigration is the problem, really, you know, because uh, uh, when, uh, when President Trump uh, put what they call the Muslim ban, it was not a Muslim ban. He wanted to get only, uh, he banned seven countries. We have 55 Muslim countries. He banned seven countries where we don't have enough intelligence, like Syria, uh, uh, I think Pakistan, Yemen, you know, etc. Somalia. These countries, we don't have intelligence. You know, we cannot really determine if those people are safe to uh, accept as refugees or not. And we don't really open doors for, like, uh, like our my friends who came to Salam, the the Sudanese waited 12 years. You know, a Syrian refugee can come here in six months. Why a Sudanese Christian refugee would take him 12 years to come here? You know, so uh, now uh, uh, the Dutch, uh, I mean the right wing uh, Dutch politician, won uh, elections and he's going to limit immigration. He says because. I, I was in Europe for 14 days. I'm an obse observer. I, I think Europe is gone, mainly. Europe is gone. We have to work on, you know, freedom of expression here, freedom of faith. Uh, I'm afraid that our young generation has fooled, you know. Mm -hmm. You see on campuses how the, the movements are pro kind of woke, and even in Christian colleges, you know. And uh, they are fooled into accepting the uh, simplistic uh, narrative that the world is divided into oppressed and oppressors. It's more complicated than that, you know. And uh, uh, even though, I mean, I mean, the Palestinian question is more complicated than, you know, a, uh, a student in, uh, on campus would understand. I am an expert. This is why I can sort out things, you know. But uh, many of those who chant freedom, uh, Palestine free from the, from the uh, uh, river to the sea, they don't know what river and they don't know what kind of sea, you know. So uh, we need uh, more education, we need more awareness, we need more to be more active in our churches. Uh, we need evangelism in order to bring in the lost, you know, to the church. And uh, as I said in my message, we need really to use our freedom of speech and expression uh, before we lose it. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, sir. In uh, Europe, what countries have they kind of integrated into, or quite a few countries, or the Muslims? Uh, I am afraid that uh, mo uh, most European countries there is no integration. There are also no go zones, you know, like Sweden, in Sweden, and uh, in France. Uh, if you remember the riots in France, because uh, many uh, uh, Muslim immigrants and descendants of immigrants as well feel that they are not integrated and uh, they, uh, they feel that they uh, don't belong, you know. So I'm afraid that integration is very low, you know. Or uh, you're saying, but you're saying the they, situation uh, in America is better, sorry. But you say that there's a lot of Muslims in, in Europe? Yes. Uh, like uh, uh, the largest Muslim population is in Britain, in the UK, you know, and they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the experts say 20% of the Muslims in Britain are radical. So 20% of 8 million. Okay. So uh, the same number maybe in France. Belgium is a small country, but the Muslims are 7% of the country. Most, uh, actually, most uh, fighters of ISIS came from Belgium, <laughs> you know, a small European country that, you know, imagine. So, uh, so radicalization is going on, and, uh, and this uh, war in the Middle East is not helping, you know, at all. Yeah. It, it was my understanding that at the end of World War II, especially with the Allied Nations, <clears throat> A lot of uh, Arabs or Muslims uh, immigrated to Europe. A lot of them got work, uh, uh, and the ones that are radicalized today the most are mainly second and third generation Muslims because uh, although their parents or grandparents were able to assimilate right. to a right. certain extent, they can't because for one a lack of work but other because of the radicalization you're talking you talked about there are two elements in that uh, the first element is that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia before uh, this uh, crown prince came they used to uh, uh, export their radical version of Islam if you want a mosque and uh, on prime land uh, we can support you, but we'll send you an imam, okay? They'll send a radical imam who would radicalize the community, you know? Like uh, this imam was, uh, yeah, uh, he, he was taught in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, okay, this imam. So, uh, uh, so the new generation receive, uh, is growing in parochial schools that are radical, okay? I uh, used to listen to his uh, Friday uh, sermons on YouTube, and he used to tell uh, or, uh, what, when, what I heard from him is that he was telling uh, uh, male uh, Muslims, you uh, husbands and uh, fathers, you are responsible for the female household members. Do not let them go out without hijab. You are responsible for their shame. You are responsible for their, their sins. Okay, for, I'm, I'm just an example, you know. So the parochial schools that were sprang up in the West, okay, from, from uh, let, let me say, from, uh, even from China to California, are run by radical Muslims who were taught radical Islam either in Saudi Arabia or Egypt, okay. The old Muslims were traditional Muslims. The, when I grew up in, in Lebanon, uh, I was the youngest man in the mosque. When he, I used to go to the mosque, it was always elderly people. Now the mosques are full of young people, you know. And radical Islam has really spread very, very widely. So parochial schools are run by radical imams, radical leaders, and also uh, Islamic organizations are run by radical leaders. Another element is that uh, 
in the past, when an immigrant used to come to Wisconsin, okay, from Lebanon, he would visit Lebanon once every 10 years, maybe, okay? And he would call Lebanon maybe once a month, you know, uh, from uh, a payphone, okay? Now you have people on WhatsApp every moment, okay? So many people live in this country physically, but they live mentally in their countries of origin, and they live in, the, in a bubble, you know? So if you go to the south side of Chicago, for example, you find 90% of women are veiled, you know, with a hijab. If you go to Dearborn, Michigan, any Muslim neighborhood, you'll find that, uh, you know, my wife uh, drives a, uh, uh, called first student, like a bus, you know, and uh, she picks Muslim students from neighborhoods and uh, when uh, women come out in the morning to give their children, they are all, all, you know, cover their faces even. It's called niqab. So there is another radicalization going on, okay? The niqab covering the face is spreading among women as well. So we are not happy about this. We hope that, uh, you know, Muslims would, would uh, integrate and that uh, uh, our culture and uh, our, you know, church would be able to attract more people to the gospel as well because the gospel is the only hope, I believe. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you talk about uh, radical Islam versus, I guess the other would be non-radical Islam, um, but yet, at least here in the United States, you don't hear of people who claim to be non-radical uh, openly criticizing the radical. I, I mean, is there consequences for them if they were? Yeah, they'll be ostracized usually, you know, and they'll not be able to find jobs. They'll not, if, if they can, if they are not integrated in the American community, they are not qualified, you know. So. Uh, They'll be ostracized. Uh, I mean, the Middle East, they may be killed, but I'm saying here, I mean, may not be their uh, physical damage, but uh, they'll be ostracized. And as well also, uh, uh, usually radical Muslims, they are more vocal, you know. Uh, there are uh, two movements of, uh, of uh, moderate Muslims. They attracted only a few people, you know. Uh, one of them uh, co uh, led by Dr. Zohdi, ja Zohdi Jasser, who is a Syrian-American, and he was a Navy uh, doctor, you know, a veteran. So he tried really to revive uh, something what we call moderate Islam, but he didn't attract much. Because uh, the nature of Islam, I'm sorry to be pessimistic about it, the nature of Islam is uh, kind of, uh, 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 if I can say, uh, fundamentalist, you know, because uh, Islam believes that the Quran is the book of Islam, uh, letter, uh, the word of Allah, letter and meaning. And it's uh, the constitution for Muslims forever. So you cannot change one word in the Quran. You cannot explain it away. So those who interpret the Quran according to their, you know, uh, to the traditional views, which are usually radical, gain the higher upper hand, okay? Those who try to explain away the Islamic history and Islamic uh, traditions, they don't really gain much. For example, you know, uh, uh, Take, for example, marriage, okay? In Islam, a, uh, a girl could be married before puberty, okay? And this is something really kind of uh, certain because Muhammad the Prophet of Islam did it. So if Muhammad the Prophet of Islam married a, uh, a, uh, a nine-year-old uh, uh, girl, a Muslim man could do it, you know? So you cannot really fight this, okay? So there are some uh, Arab countries uh, which are saying like Tunisia, 
we're gonna, uh, they banned polygamy and banned uh, child marriages, but other countries, it's one country only, you know. Other countries are sticking to the traditional way of Islam because Muhammad is the example <laughs> of Muslims per se, you know. So you cannot really uh, kind of break the cycle. This is the problem, you know. Uh, uh, we hope that, you know, uh, you know, I, I think uh, salvation is personal and individualistic. I believe only the gospel can really break the, uh, uh, this cycle, you know, in Islam. But say, but, you know, you, you said in the United States that uh, someone outspoken against radical Islam wouldn't be, have physical harm to them, but what if they have relatives in a Muslim country? I mean, would they go after their relatives? Yes, they do. They could do that. It could be possible, right, yeah. Like, uh, even mm -hmm. if they declare that they support uh, Israel, not Palestinians, for example, you know, it will uh, harm them a lot, you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a shame culture. And, uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, examples of that, uh, somebody asked me why uh, people can uh, demonstrate uh, for Gaza and Palestine, but there are like 400,000 uh, children killed in Syria. Nobody demonstrates for them, okay? Because if you are a Syrian, refugee here and you you are seen in a demonstration they'll get your relatives in in Syria you know so by Palestinians everybody is okay with it because you're demonstrating against the Jews you know so so uh, yeah it's a culture very close culture you know yeah have you been threatened physically uh, not in the United States, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was threatened to be killed when I visited Beirut uh, 13 years ago, but not in the United States, yeah. I was told not to come back to the mosque. I used to go to a mosque and distribute flyers, but I mean, that's normal, you know. They have the right to their own premises, but no. I feel very safe, really, you know. And we need to kind of be bold, you know, not really be afraid. Okay. So the okay. Sorry. Any last question? Um, the pictures you have upstairs on your uh, display, uh, some of the faces are uh, scratched out. Is yeah. Uh, that is for their relatives? Yes, right. Okay. For their safety. Right.